Welcome to Heavy D Storytelling. We are going to be reading a story. But first up, we are going to be doing the Bible verse of the day, and then we are going to be reading the Bible, and then we are going to be doing the synopsis with Kimberly, and then we are going to be reading Around the World in 80 Days. So, I hope you guys enjoy. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell, to never miss another video. And we are going to start it off with Romans 22 through 23. I'm going to be doing Chapter 6. Chapter 6. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For... The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. What happened? The dogs. <laughs> we should have probably fed them first. I don't think they eat until afterwards. Anymore. So we are going to be doing another verse. No, you, why did I show you? You can't even. Hi, Granny Bear! But, so we are going to be doing Deuteronomy 10, 17. Flies. Dogs. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome. God who is not hard... Partial. Partial and takes no bribe. I hope you guys enjoyed. We're going to be reading the Bible now. So, let's head straight into it. Hi, Granny Bear. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Granny Bear. How are you doing? We are on Romans chapter 2. And let's go ahead and get started. This is the English Standard Version. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works to those who have who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, for when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do, n do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. 
and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by, G- by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in the darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision, indeed, is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. That is the end of Romans chapter 2. Hope you are enjoying the reading of God's word in our... Um, live stream. So we started around the world in 80 days a couple of days ago. Hopefully it takes us less than 80 days to read it. Um, So in chapter one, uh, Phileas Fogg and Passapartu, um, trying to figure out a way that one of them can die. I'm not really sure in that chapter. Let's see. And Say they have a heart um, I, I, honestly, I don't know. Okay, so they met each other in mm-hmm. chapter one. And Phileas Fogg is really eccentric, and he likes to go out on parties. He does. Um, he changes his routine every single day. For and real? here comes Kimberly to say how it really happened. Come on, this is the easiest thing to do. You don't have to kill Frodo. You don't have to blow people up. You just have to say, he does the same thing every day to the minute, and he expects all of his servants to do the same thing. Why did he fire his former servant? Because I think he was late with no, something. No, he, he served him tea two degrees too hot. No, it was tea. It was mouthwash or something. Oh, yeah, it was something. And it was shaving water. Yeah, okay. And oh. it was two degrees too hot. So, cool. wow. <laughs> That's... It was too cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> he's very particular. So, he's pretty mean, actually. <laughs> um, and then... He hired a new guy who has a, he's had a bunch of different jobs before this, and uh, let's see what happens. Can dad make the world explode next chapter? That's the big question. (sighs) Okay, so Passepartout had had many jobs But he was ready for something where he could settle down. He was convinced that Phileas Fogg was going to be that person because Phileas Fogg was a snore. Phileas Fogg literally does the same thing every single day. And when he got to inspect Phileas Fogg's apartment, he realized that he was on the right track. This place was going to be absolute boredom for him. And by the way, just one second, I think that we forgot to turn on the light here. And we did. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit dark. All right, so now we're on chapter three, in which a conversation takes place 
which seems likely to cost Phileas Fogg dear. Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy-six times, reached the Reform Club, an imposing edifice in Pall Mall, which could not have cost less than three millions, which was a lot of money in 1872, let me tell you. He repaired at once to the dining room, the, d the nine windows of which open upon a tasteful garden, where the trees were already gilded with an autumn coloring and took his place in at the habitual table, the cover of which had already been laid for him. His breakfast consisted of a side dish, a broiled fish with re redding sauce, a scarlet slice of road beef garnished with... Excuse me, roast beef, not road beef. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it was roast beef. A scarlet slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms. Scarlet sliced. That to me says that it must be rare. Um, uh, garnished with mushrooms. A rhubarb and gooseberry tart. A morsel of Cheshire cheese. The whole being washed down with several cups of tea for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one and directed his steps toward the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunky handed him an uncut times, which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with, his, with this delicate operation. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until a quarter before four, whilst the standard, his next task, occupied him till the din dinner hour. Dinner passed as breakfast had done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading room and sat down at uh, to the Pall Mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later, several members of the reform came in and drew up to the fireplace where a coal fire was steadily burning. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at whist, Andrew Stewart, an engineer, John Sullivan, and Samuel Fallenton, bankers, Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Gauthier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages, even in a club which comprises the Prince of English Trade and Finance. Well, Ralph, said Thomas Flanagan, what about that robbery? Oh, replied Stuart, the bank will lose the money. On the contrary, broke in Ralph, I hope we may put our hands on the robber. Skillful detectives have been sent to all the principal ports of America and the continent, and he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers. But have you got the robber's description? asked Stuart. In the first place, he is no robber at all, returned Ralph positively. What? A fellow who makes off with twenty-five thousand pounds? No robber? No. Perhaps he's a manufacturer, then. The Daily Telegraph says that he is a gentleman. It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject, and which was town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of banknotes to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds had been taken from the principal cashier's table, that functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and six pence. Of course, he could not have... he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There is, There are neither guards nor greetings nor grating, excuse me, to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed at the mercy of the first comer. A keen observer of English customs relates that, being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up, scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor, he to the next man, and so on, until the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for half an hour. Meanwhile, the cashier had not so much as raised his head. 
but in the present instance things had not gone so smoothly, the package of notes not being found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. As soon as the robbery was discovered, picket detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Havre, uh, Suez, Brindisi, New York, and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of two thousand pounds and five per cent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who arrived at or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was at once entered upon. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band. On the day of the robbery, a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners and with well-to-do air had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed. A description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives, and some hopeful spirits of whom Ralph was one did not despair of his apprehension. The papers and clubs were full of the affair, and everywhere people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit, and the Reform Club was especially agitated, several of its members being bank officials. Ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain, for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity, but Stuart was far from sharing this confidence, and as they placed themselves at the whist table, they continued to argue the matter. Stuart and Flanagan played together while Phineas Fo excuse me, Phileas Fogg had Fallentin for his partner. As the game proceeded, the conversation ceased, excepting between the rubbers when it revived again. I maintain, said Stuart, that the chances are in favor of the thief, who must be a shrewd fellow. Well, but where can he fly to? asked Ralph. No country is safe for him. Pshaw! Where could he go then? Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough. It was once, said Phileas Fogg, in a low tone. Cut, sir, he added, handing the cards to Thomas Flanagan. The discussion fell during the rubber, after which Stuart took up its thread. What do you mean by once? Had the world grown smaller? Certainly, returned Ralph. I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller, since man can now go round it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago, and that is why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed, and also why the thief can get away more easily. Be so good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg, but the incredulous Stewart was not convinced, and when the hand was finished, said, I, said eagerly, you have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller, so because you can go round it in three months, in eighty days, interrupted Phileas Fogg, that is true, gentlemen, added John Sullivan, only eighty days now that the section between Rothal and Allahabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway have been opened. Here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph. From London to Suez via Mont Cenis and Brindisi by rail and steamboats, seven days. From Suez to Bombay by steamer, thirteen days. From Bombay to Calcutta by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamer, 13 days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama, Japan by steamer, 6 days. From Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer, 22 days. From San Francisco to New York by rail, 7 days. From New York to London by steamer and rail, 9 days. Total, 80 days. Yes, in 80 days, exclaimed Stuart, who in his excitement made a false deal. But that doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, returned Phileas Fogg, continuing to play, despite the discussion. But suppose the Hindus or Indians pull up the rails, replied Stuart. Suppose they stop the trains, pillage the luggage vans, and scalp the passengers. All included, calmly retorted Fogg, adding as he threw down the cards, two trumps. Stuart whose turn it was to deal, gathered them up and went on. You are right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically, practically also, Mr. Stewart. I'd like to see you do it in 80 days. Depends on you. Shall we go? Heaven pursue, 
preserve me, but I would wager 4,000 pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible. Quite possible, on the contrary, returned Mr. Fogg. Well, make it, then. The journey round the world in 80, in 80 days? Yes, I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense. It's absurd, cried Stuart, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. Come, let's go on with the game. Deal over again, then, said Phi Phileas Fogg. There's a false deal. Stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand and then suddenly put them down again. Well, Mr. Fogg, said he, it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it. Calm yourself, my dear Stuart, said Valentin. It's only a joke. When I say I'll wager, returned Stuart, I mean it. All right, said Mr. Fogg, turning to the others. He continued, I have a deposit of twenty thousand at Bearings, which I will willingly risk upon it. Twenty thousand pounds, cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds, which you would lose by a single accidental delay? The unforeseen does not exist, quietly replied Phileas Fogg. But, Mr. Fogg, eighty days are only the estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. But in order, in order not to exceed it, you must jump mathematically from the trains upon the steamers, and from the steamers upon the trains again. I will jump. Mathematically. You're joking. A true Englishman doesn't joke when he is talking about so serious a thing as a wager, replied Phileas Fogg solemnly. I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept? We accept, replied Mr. Mr.'s... Stuart, Fallenton, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph, after consulting each other. Good, said Mr. Fogg. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it. This very evening, asked Stuart. This very evening, returned Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac and added, And today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October. I shall be due in London, in this very room of the Reform Club, on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before 9 p.m., or else the 20,000 pounds now deposited in my name at Bearings will belong to you in fact and in right, gentlemen. Here is a check for the amount." A memorandum of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties, during which Phileas Fogg preserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win, and had only staked the twenty thousand pounds half of his fortune, because he foresaw that he might have to expend the other half to carry out this difficult, not to say unattainable, project. As for his antagonists, they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake, as because they had some scruples about betting under conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so that Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. "'I am quite ready now,' was his tranquil re response. "'Diamonds are trumps, so uh, be so good as to play, gentlemen.' So they're playing a game of cards. Chapter 4, in which Phileas Fogg astounds Passepartout, his servant. Having won twenty guinea at whist and taken leave of his friend, Phileas Fogg, at twenty-five minutes past seven, left the Reform Club. Passepartout, who had conscientiously studied the program of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at the unaccustomed hour, for according to the rule, he was not due in Seville Row until precisely midnight. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passepartout! Passepartout did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passepartout! repeated Mr. Fogg, without raising his voice. Excuse me, I did raise my voice a little bit. Passepartout made his appearance. I have called you twice, observed his master. But it's not midnight, responded the other, showing his watch. I know it, I, I don't blame you. We start for Dover in Calais in ten minutes. A puzzled grin overspread Passepartout's round face. Clearly, he had not comprehended his master. 
Monsieur is going to leave home? Yes, returned Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world. Passepartout opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse. So overcome was he with stupefied astonishment. Round the world, he, re he murmured. In eighty days, responded Mr. Fogg. So we haven't a moment to lose. But the trunks, gaped, uh, gasped Passepartout, unconsciously swaying his head from right to left. We'll have no trunks, only a carpet bag with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me, and the same for you. We'll buy our clothes on the way, bring down my Mackintosh and traveling cloak, and some stout shoes, though we shall do a little walking. We shall do little walking. Make haste. Passepartout tried to reply, but could not. He went out, mounted to his own room, fell into a chair, and muttered, That's good. It is. And who wanted to remain quiet? He mechanically set about making the preparations for departure. Around the world in eighty days. Was his master a fool? No. Was this a joke, then? They were going to Dover. Good. To Calais? Good again. After all, Passepartout, who had been away from France five years, would not be sorry to set foot on his native soil again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more. But surely a gentleman so sherry of his steps would not stop there, no doubt. But then it was none the less true that he was going away, this so domestic person hitherto. Which, by the way, the... the um, Calais to Dover is the channel uh, nowadays, so it's even faster than... Um, well, obviously, everything's faster now, but that's where the the tunnel that goes under the English Channel. By 8 o'clock, Passepartout had packed the modest carpet bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself. Then, still troubled in mind, he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was quite ready. Under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway Steam uh, Transit and General Guide with its timetable showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways. He took the carpet bag, opened it, and slipped into it a goodly roll of, in of Bank of England notes, which would pass what wherever he might go. You have forgotten nothing, said he. Nothing, monsieur, my Mackintosh and cloak. Here they are. Good. Take this carpet bag handing it to Passepartout. Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it. Passepartout nearly dropped the bag, as if the twenty thousand pounds were in gold and weighed him down. Master and man then descended. The street door was double locked, and at the end of Seville Row, they took a cab and drove rapidly to the Sharing Cross. The cab uh, stopped before the railway station at twenty minutes past eight, Passepartout jumped off the box and followed his master, who, after paying the cabman, was about to enter the station when a poor beggar woman with a child in her arms, her naked feet smeared with mud, her head covered with a wretched bonnet from which hung a tattered feather, and her shoulders shrouded in a ragged shawl, approached and mournfully asked for alms. Mr. Fogg took out the twenty guinea he had just won at whist, and handed them to the beggar, saying, Here, my good woman, I'm glad that I met you, and passed on. Passepartout had a moist sensation about the eyes. His master's action touched his susceptible heart. Two first-class tickets for Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train when he perceived his five friends of the reform. "'Well, gentlemen,' said he, "'I'm off, you see, and if you will examine my passport when I get back, "'you will be able to judge whether I have accomplished the journey agreed upon.' "'Oh, that would be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg,' said Ralph politely. "'We will trust your word as a gentleman of honor. "'You do not forget when you are due in London again,' asked Stuart. "'In eighty days, on Saturday, the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before 9 p.m. "'Goodbye, gentlemen.' "'Phileas Fogg and his servant seated themselves in a first-class carriage at twenty minutes before nine. Five minutes later, the whistle screamed, and the train slowly glided out of the station. "'The night was dark, and a fine, steady rain was falling.' 
Phileas Fogg, snugly ensconced in his corner, did not open his lips. Passepartout, not yet recovered from his stupefaction, clung mechanically to the carpet bag with its enormous treasure. Just as the train was whirling through Sydenham, Passepartout suddenly uttered a cry of despair. "'What's the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'Alas! In my hurry! I, I forgot!' What? To turn off the gas in my room. Very well, young man, returned Mr. Fogg coolly. It will burn at your expense. Chapter 5 or not chapter 5? It's two and a half pages. Chapter 5. All right, chapter 5. In which a new species of funds, unknown to the moneyed men, appears on change. Phileas Fogg rightly suspected that his departure from London would create a lively sensation at the West End. The news of the bet spread through the Reform Club and afforded an exciting topic of conversation to its members. From the club, it soon got into the papers throughout England. The boasted tour of the world was talked about, disputed, argued with as much warmth as if the subject were another Alabama claim. Some took sides with Phileas Fogg, but the large majority shook their heads and declared against him. It was absurd, impossible, they declared, that the tour of the world could be made, except theoretically and on paper, in this minimum of time, and with the existing means of traveling. The Times, Standard, Morning Post, and Daily News, and 20 other highly respectable newspapers scouted Mr. Fogg's project as madness. The Daily Telegraph alone hesitatingly supported him. People in general thought him a lunatic and blamed his Reform Club friends for having accepted a wager which betrayed the mental aberration of its pros uh, pro proposer. Articles no less passionate than logical appeared on the question, for geography is one of the pet subjects of the English, and the columns devoted to Phileas Fogg's venture were eagerly devoured by all classes of readers. At first some rash individuals, principally of the gentler sex, espoused his cause, which became still more popular when the illustrated London news came out with his portrait, copied from a photograph in the Reform Club. A few readers of the Daily Telegraph even dared to say, Why not, after all? Stranger things have come to pass. At last, a long article appeared on the 7th of October in the Bulletin of the Royal Geog Geographical Society, which treated the question from every point of view and demonstrated the utter folly of the enterprise. Everything, it said, was against the travelers, every obstacle imposed alike by man and by nature, a miraculous agreement of the times of departure and arrival, which was impossible, was absolutely necessary uh, to his success. He might perhaps reckon on the arrival of trains at the designated hours in Europe, where the distances were relatively moderate. But when he calculated upon crossing India in three days and the United States in seven, could he rely beyond misgiving upon accomplishing his task? There were accidents to ma machinery, the liability of trains to run off the line, collisions, bad weather, the blocking up by snow. Were not all these against Phileas Fogg? Would he not find himself, when traveling by steamer in the winter, at the mercy of the winds and fogs? It is un or is it uncommon for the best ocean steamers to be two or three days behind time? But a single delay would suffice to fatally break the chain of communication. Should Phileas Fogg once miss, even by an hour a steamer, he would have to wait for the next, and that would irrevocably render his attempt vain. Everybody knows that England is the world of betting men who are of a higher class than mere gamblers. To bet is in the English temperament. Not only the members of the reform, but the general public made heavy wagers for or against Phileas Fogg, who was set down in the betting books as if he were a racehorse. Bonds were issued and made their appearance on change. Phileas Fogg bonds were offered at par or at a premium, and a great business was done in them, but five days after the article in the bulletin of the Geographical Society appeared, the demand began to subside. Phileas Fogg declined. They were offered by packages at 
first of five, then of ten, until at last nobody would take less than twenty, fifty, a hundred. Lord Albemarle, an elderly paralytic gentleman, was now the only advocate of Phileas Fogg left. This noble lord, who was fastened to his chair, would have given his fortune to be able to make the tour of the world if it took ten years, and he bet five thousand pounds on Phileas Fogg. When the folly as well as the uselessness of the adventure was pointed out to him, he contented himself with replying, If the thing is feasible, the first to do it ought to be an Englishman. The fog party dwindled more and more. Everybody was going against him, and the bet stood a hundred and fifty, a hundred and fifty and two hundred to one, and a week after his departure an incident occurred which deprived him of backers at any price. The commissioner of police was sitting in his office at nine o'clock one evening when the following telegraphic dispatch was put into his hands. Suez to London. Rowan, commissioner of police, Scotland Yard. I found the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Send without delay warrant of arrest to Bombay. Fix, detective. The effect of this dispatch was instantaneous. The polished gentleman disappeared to give place to the bank robber. His photograph, which was hung with those of the rest of the members of the Reform Club, was minutely examined, and it betrayed feature by feature the description of the robber which had been provided to the police. The mysterious habits of Phileas Fogg were recalled, his solitary ways, his sudden departure, and it seemed clear that... In undertaking a tour round the world on the pretext of a wager, he had no other end in view than to elude the detectives and throw them off his track. And that is the end of chapter five. Chapter Tomorrow six. we will read chapter six, in which Fix, the detective, betrays a very natural impatience. And the first word is the. I hope you're enjoying the reading of Around the World in 80 Days. Can we do one more chapter tonight? No, we're not doing one more chapter tonight. <laughs> so, I'm glad that you're enjoying the story, Daniel. It looks like we've got an art gallery coming, so enjoy the gallery, and here's Kimberly. Um, I did this today. Ta-da! I hope you guys have a good day, and um, thank you for tuning in to Heavy D Storytelling. Um, have a good day, and God...